works really well. So th there is sort of a uh, possibly rare rare circumstance, but but an interesting one, and that is if you have a scenario where you're experiencing both breakouts and drilling-induced tensile fractures at the same time, that allows you a way to estimate the strength of the rock via a more Coulomb model. And so a few weeks ago, I presented this equation uh, that was a way to get SH max from breakout data. And by the way, I'm timely putting this back up because it, it might be that you need an equation very similar to this or this equation to do your homework. Right? That's due on Monday. Okay. So uh, in this equation, you know, if you're experiencing breakouts, then you could use a well logging system, a televiewer, to measure the width of the breakouts. Right. So the denominator is all known things. You can do D fit to get SH min. So now uh, the numerator has all known things except for C0, right? And then you have SH max there. Well, if you're experiencing um, if you're experiencing tensile-induced fractures, then from those equations, right, then you have SH max is a known via this, right? So we take that guy and put it there, and the only unknown in the equation then is C0. And then you can solve that equation for C0, and you can get an estimate of the rock strength. So, <clears throat> um, and by the way, today's lecture will conclude. Uh, what we'll be covering on the test. And, and even this part, uh, specifically what I'm going to talk about now, if I ask you anything, it'll certainly just be qualitative. Um, because really, f the next few slides are, um, you know, based on utilizing the, the, the preliminary or the elementary principles that you've learned about the strength of rock, failure models, and other things, uh, to basically see what kinds of things you can do with them. Or, but, but in this case, you have to really go further than what the scope of this class allows for. And so if you take, if you ever take a, my advanced geomechanics class, then you actually learn the, the sort of things we're talking about here, where you use finite element analysis to uh, you know, really build up powerful geomechanical models. And so in this case, this is a, a case study that Zoback presents in several cases in the book. Uh, but in, in this case, we'll look at a couple of things that uh, you know, came about uh, by, via the case study. And in this case, uh, this is a Cook Inlet, Alaska, where they were drilling uh, basically from one initial vertical well several uh, kickoffs uh, to horizontal legs. And they, and, and they ran into some trouble and other things. So they actually came back later. They, when, they, when they actually did this, uh, when they actually drilled this, these series of wells, they didn't have a geomechanical model. They, they actually built it after the fact. And they sort of went back and retrospectively asked some questions about, well, if we'd have had the model beforehand, how would it have changed the decisions we made? And, if, and, and, and then you know, how would those decisions have affected the amount of money we, we could have you know, made or, and or not lost in, in this case, OK? And so, uh, the first, the first thing to note is just the simple idea that you know th this is a, this is one of those lower hemisphere projection plots like we, uh, you know, actually made one in class, right? Uh, and the one we made in class was um, based on the strength of the rock. In this, in this case, I think they sort of combined several factors to produce a visualization. But the idea is the same in that you know the blue, the cool areas are more stable regions and the red areas are less stable regions uh, in terms of um, wellbore breakout width. Uh, you, you, know, I, you know, if you can read this, but it's saying, you know, required mud weight. Uh, these these arrows pointing up are required mud weight, uh, 
the breakout width in, will increase and the required strength will increase as you go from cool to warm. Okay, and then of course remember the lowest temperature projection uh, again is oriented with the cardinal coordinates, and then the radial lines as you go out are high, higher and higher deviations of the well. Well, the first thing is if you just consider two wells that they actually drilled, in this case they were highly deviated, they're basically horizontal wells. One that was drilled here, so if we assume it's a horizontal well, it's drilled more or less to the north, northwest, right? So a horizontal well on this lower hemisphere projection would appear on the very end, right? And so if we draw a dot sort of where the well was drilled, something like that, right? And the thing to note was, again, remember this was, this was built after they did this, okay? But the thing to note is when they actually drilled this well, they had no problems with wellbore stability. Not surprising with the geomechanical model. In this case, however, another horizontal well drilled to the northeast, so over here, right, in a region where you'd expect to have less stable well bores, and in fact, in this well they did have many, many, so you can't see, I'll, I'll highlight the well. So in this, in this case, uh, they had lots of problems, severe problems with wellbore stability, which re required multiple deviations of the well and, and, uh, and, and casing and other things, okay? So, So this is sort of an aside, but uh, there's another another kind of thing that came since since there, in this case there was one vertical well in which they were performing multiple deviations from or kickoffs. Whenever you kick off from a vertical well, you want to do it in an area of high rock strength. Okay. So what they were able to do is they took they took several cores as they drilled the vertical well. They took several cores and they were able to go back to the laboratory and do a bunch of tests and they came up with this sort of empirical model uh, based on some reservoir parameters for uh, what the strength of the rock is. And now, I don't love empirical models and you see this a lot in, you know, I, I sort of joke whenever you, whenever you see like coefficients like that in front of, in front of numbers and you see it all the time in petroleum engineering, right? Uh, that didn't come from F equals MA, right? <laughs> this, is, this is came from an empirical model. And so you, you sort of lose some of the, and the reason I don't, or, you know, you have, a, not to say I don't like them, but have a, you know, you have a preference to do something more scientific is because, of course, this is just associated with this one single well, right? You couldn't take this empirical model and go anywhere else and do anything with it meaningful. Um, but in this case, you know, so this is a, this is density of the rock and the, and the uh, pressure s sound speed. Um, from the sonogram, then you can, they could roughly determine what the strength of the rock is, and given that now they have some estimate of the strength of the rock, they can determine where uh, they should do the kickoffs, okay? So that's another sort of uh, thing that's in your tool house now that you, you, you understand something about how rocks fail, behave, and fail. Um, so, in order to answer the question about casing, it's not just uh, pure wellbore stability in the sense of drilling, right? Um, it, it also has to do with sand production. Uh, you would want to case a well that's going to produce a lot of sand. And of course, sand production is, is the petroleum engineering lingo that basically says you're taking on reservoir solids uh, during the production process. So it's not, it, it's sort of a misnomer in that it's not always sand in the sense of quartz, right? It could be whatever the reservoir is. Uh, if you're taking on or bringing back solids with the reservoir fluid, that the terminology of the lingo is called sand production, right? And it turns out that, you know, s sand production problem is sort of the stability problem or the wellbore breakout problem in reverse. Uh, now now the, the pressure in the wellbore 
is lower than the reservoir pressure, so it's it's analogous to an underbalanced drilling scenario, right? And that that pressure differential right there at the well bore uh, can you know basically combine with what you know about the stress intensity, the Kerr solutions, and other things uh, can cause a well and, and a failure model can cause the well bore to fail. Right? Now the reason that you you know, if, if, you, if, if everything was quasi-static, if we could produce the well in a steady state scenario, we could use the tools that we know in this class to determine if there's going to be, at least, you know, with a simple model, a more Coulomb model or whatnot, we could use the tools that we've determined, used in this class to determine if the well is going to produce sand or not. But the reason you have to do something more advanced, and that's what we talk about in advanced geomechanics, um, is because, it, you know, the, the uh, Near well bore pressure is highly dependent on the drawdown rate. So, in other words, how fast you're producing, uh, or you know, the the, the the pressure differential. I'm sorry, the pressure differential between the bottom hole pressure and the reservoir pressure um, is what you know sort of causes the fluid to flow at a certain rate. And and depending on how that pressure differential is, uh, it can cause more or less stress around the well bore, which can cause more or less sand production, okay? So uh, these, these models were done with a finite element simulation with, you know, transient dynamics. So now you're including the effect of time and the, f and the, and the effect of time and, and uh, the, the, the pressure changes that will occur as the reservoir fluids are produced. And you couple that with a geomechanical model that predicts the elastic and inelastic properties. Um, and in this case, these are contours of something we call equivalent plastic strain. So uh, if you remember, when we were talking about how materials behave, I had a stress strain curve. And of course, if, if a material is just elastic, it just looks like that, right? Uh, and if it's elastic brittle, then it just fails, right? But we talked about how rocks, or at least I showed a curve with some real data on rocks, that under different levels of confining pressure can actually have some inelastic response. Right? Right, so at a low confining pressure, it may look like that. And at a higher confining pressure, it may look like that. And at a higher, even higher confining pressure, it may look like that. And you know, ultimately, if it's under really, really high confinement, the rock can almost look like a metal. Right? It just continues to flow plastically. Um, post yielding, and so uh, what equivalent plastic strain is? If you were to if you were to follow any of these curves up, if you were to take this material and then unload it, <coughs> you're going to unload elastically. Okay, and this distance, you know, this distance right here is an equivalent plastic strain. Okay. And so a lot of there's some damagement models or failure models that basically uh, say that you know at a given equivalent plastic strain you'll have material failure, material separation, and that's what's typically used in these sand production models. So they say okay, at five percent plastic strain. So we we do the computation, you know we actually we we do the computation with the full up inelastic model full up inelastic response. So we're going to load up, follow one of these curves, depending upon the complexity of that model. And then we're going to accumulate plastic strain. And at a given plastic strain, we're going to decide, OK, that mater material is going to separate. And we're going to include that as some volume of sand produced. Okay, And so this is sort of the uh, these two different plots. So in, the, in this case, uh, you know, you have a 500 PSI drawdown. and, and uh, slow, you'd have to go back and read the original paper to know what slow is, uh, but, but let's just, you know, qualitatively slow is less than rapid, right, in terms of production rate. So um, in the slow drawdown, you, you know, you can estimate, or they did estimate, that you'd have 60-degree uh, breakouts according to some equivalent plastic strain criterion, and um, at, the, at the higher um, at the higher drawdown, at the rapid drawdown, then you'd have something like 90 degree breakouts, which of course would be pretty, that would be uh, pretty dangerous uh, 
uh, scenario in terms of wellbore stability could lead to a full washout, and you'd produce a lot of sand. Right? And of course, that's bad. Sand reduction is bad because you have to deal with it at the surface. Right? You can't just put it in the pipe and sell it. So, you know, this is to, to perform these type of simulations. A little, you know, it's just a small extension of what we learn in this class. Right? Uh, and if you take advanced geomechanics, then then you get we we solve problems like that. Um, so, since we're talking about sand production. You know, we can one way, and it's sort of clear from the previous plot, but but one way we can um, limit or prevent sand production is just by li limiting the the production rate. So uh, over here on the y-axis, you have the b bottom hole pressure, and here you have the re reservoir pressure, and of course along the straight line they're equivalent to one another. And in that case, in well, would it flow at all, right? So you have to you have to the bottom hole pressure needs to be Something less than the reservoir pressure, and whatever the di the difference is between the two, that's that's of course called your drawdown. Right? Right. And so you can see these curves, and these were created with, you know, again full geomechanical models. So these curves here indicate different unconfined compressive strengths. So at a thousand psi, you could have a maximum drawdown um, if the reservoir pressure was 40 psi. You could have a maximum drawdown of what well, something like uh, 10, 20, 25 psi, right? But if the reservoir pressure was 1,600 psi, you could draw it down to 40, right? And, the, and uh, if the reservoir pressure was 8, 1,800 psi, you can draw it down 40 again. Right? So you can have a, you can use the, you can build up these types of information uh, to help you determine for a given rock type. Um, what your maximum drawdown, and as long as you stay below that, so as long as you stay, you know, in this region or to the right of it, then you're going to be safe in terms of sand production. So these would be other things you could do, sort of given the things you have learned. Um, you can also it's possible to prevent sand production with perforation orientation. So if you had, say, a horizontal well, well, it doesn't really matter, uh, horizontal or vertical, um, where you had your S3 or, you know, if it was a, horizontal, uh, if it was a vertical well, then it would be SH min. But if you had your minimum principal stress was here, uh, well, this, of course, we know is where breakouts are going to occur, right? So that's where the highest compressive strength around the borehole is, right? So if we if we want if we perforate into that area, we're creating weaknesses in an area that's already inclined to fail due to the high compressive nature, right? And so it it is possible if you orient your perforations to avoid that area, say. So if you were to say perforate in this direction then you would produce less sand. And this is demonstrated here. So this is for a horizontal well and a vertical well. This is, again, plastic strain versus um, well. I think this plot is wrong. The next plot is the right one. This is actually a, a well deviation. Okay. So it's the same idea, but of course, because you by deviating the well, you're you're changing where S3 occurs along the uh, along the bore, borehole. And then in this case, you can so so forget my drawing here. This drawing applies to the next slide, okay? Uh, but of course, as you deviate the well, you're changing where S3 occurs, and then you can basically control sand production in that way. So this this line. Is like 4% plastic strain. That's just some sort of rule of thumb criterion that says, you know, if you if you have over 4% equivalent plastic strain, then these are areas where you're going to be expected to produce sand. So in this case, for horizontal uh, for horizontal well, 
then you're, you're going to be expected to produce salmon for the for this uh, deviation. Okay. So the next slide then is is the one that corresponds to my drawing. And so now this is perf angle from vertical. So so if you have if if S3 was aligned with vertical. Um, I guess according to this, it would be S3 would be aligned with horizontal because you're expected to produce sand here. So if S3, uh, if, if this was the horizontal direction, if this was 90 degrees on that chart, so, um, so this is zero, and that's 90, yeah. then uh, then those are areas that are going to be more inclined to produce sand. And in this case, they show different depletion and drawdowns as well. So at, at, uh, at no depletion, no drawdown, you produce less sand than if you had no depletion and some drawdown. And then after you have more, depre more depletion, you have more compression <laughs> on the borehole, then, then, then that causes even more sand production. And this is that 4% equivalent plastic strain line again. So anything above that, you're going to be at a high risk of, of a high risk of a sand production. Uh, so in this case, you can see that it's it's it is fairly sensitive to the orientation. So it it, it, it would matter, right? If you if you perforate at zero degrees, then you know, you're not, it's, you're not going to produce any sand. It's, it's unlikely you're going to produce any sand. Whereas if you, per, if you perforate into S3, then you, you know, you're very likely to produce sand for a given reservoir configuration. So I think that's... This is one more chain, one more last slide, and and it's sort of just the, the the last thing. Of course, it's it's the same idea. By you know, it's the same idea as deviating the well. If you can drill in a different direction, and of course you change the angle of S3 with respect to the well bore, and then you have different azimuth uh, versus uh, bottom hole pressure, and you can so so all of these type of plots you you have the tools to create. Right, is basically. The story here, so you 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 have the tools. You know about rock strength. You know about stresses around boreholes, and you know faced with any of these problems, you know you should be able to generate plots like this that give you a space to understand if you're going to have stable well bores, if you're going to have sand production, and other things like that. Okay, so you know these last few slides when you get to dealing with equivalent plastic strain and all that, then you know, we're, we're sort of beyond the scope of this class, but uh, but qualitatively, uh, it's all the same ideas that we've already talked about with respect. To really, the difference is is you need a, a, a um, you need to take it a little further with the failure model, right? So, you know, previous previously we just said, well, we're going to use a more Coulomb model, and if the stress exceeds the criterion, then you just have breakout, so you have failure. Uh, to, to do this, you know, to estimate the amount of sand production you're going to have and other things, then you have to do, you have to take it a little further than that. You have to actually run a simulation to, to determine, you know, exactly how much sand production you're going to produce and other things like that. And how much, you have to accumulate plastic strain. And uh, so, um, with that, I guess we'll end a little early today just because I don't want to.